Good morning, everyone here in, uh, in California. I am also greeting, uh, good evening, Adam Thompson uh, in uh, London or in Brussels right now. I'm in uh, deepest rural Scotland, Rose, actually. Uh, okay, well, that's, that accounts for the snow that you mentioned a moment ago. Hiding from the pandemic. I, I, see, I see. Well, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Adam Thompson uh, to do the first in our European Security Initiative lectures for this uh, winter quarter. And I was so happy that he has decided to uh, join us because uh, I was so happy last Wednesday when President Biden took the oath of office and one of the few things that he mentioned uh, about foreign policy in his uh, inauguration speech uh, was that he wanted to immediately be rebuilding our relationships with our allies and partners abroad. That goes very much for the, for the NATO alliance, of course, but I uh, believe and hope it will also go for our relationship with the EU. There is, of course, many, uh, there, there are many countries who are members both of NATO and the EU, and I think uh, and believe that the current administration will be focused on rebuilding those relationships. So I think uh, it's very timely for Adam Thompson to give us an update on where things stand with regard to both NATO and the EU uh, with regard to security and defense policy. Many of you know that there were, um, well, a number of disagreements uh, in, in recent years about how far the EU, for example, should go on developing its own inherent defense capability. And I think no one is better placed to help us sort through where things stand today on these issues than Adam Thompson. When I first uh, arrived at NATO as the newly minted DSG in October of 2016, sadly, Adam was on his way out the door as the uh, the uh, UK ambassador to NATO, but he kindly sat down with me on several afternoons and talked me through what some of the insider issues were. So I was very gr grateful to him at the time. And, uh, and I've been very grateful ever since to, uh, well, benefit from his wisdom on these matters. Now, Sir Adam Thompson is the, uh, also the director of the European Security Initiative, uh, I'm sorry, the European Leadership Network. And uh, in that capacity, he's been doing a lot of innovative work with a number of, of teams of experts and senior figures uh, in Europe and really across the globe on important issues such as where do we go from here on protecting our uh, national command authority. So the work of, of the leadership, the European leadership uh, initiative, uh, I keep saying that, sorry, the uh, European leadership uh, network is very broad and very, very diverse. So it's with, the warmest possible words, uh, Adam, I welcome you to our uh, discussion today and uh, over to you. You're on mute, there you go. Thank you very much indeed, Rose. Um, it really is a, a privilege to have the opportunity to discuss with everyone uh, where the transatlantic relationship and the NATO EU one stands um, and it's a real honor to uh, be invited by you Rose. Uh, uh, I hardly need to say it but I had nothing to teach you about NATO when you arrived in 2016. Um, my, my remarks are going to be divided into three sections. Um, first I must make good on the claim uh, in the flyer for this meeting that transatlantic security relations have changed permanently and fundamentally. Uh, second, I want to address some current NATO-EU dynamics. And uh, finally, I'd like to try and suggest a bit about what should be done. Uh, and I'm going to try and keep that to just 20 to 25 minutes to leave uh, a lot of time for discussion which means uh, that you're going to have to forgive me for uh, brutally uh, compressing, generalizing, and simplifying a very large, complex, and important set of issues. Uh, but uh, I, I believe that the basic argument is really quite simple, that the transatlantic security relationship has changed, and that both sides of the Atlantic Ocean need to embrace that change and not fight it. Um, because of what I'm going to say, I just need to add a little bit about myself personally to what Rose 
has said about my professional background, which has been uh, a career diplomat uh, working in European security a lot of the time over 38 years and now running a pan-European NGO working for a safer Europe. Uh, I'm half American. My mother, my mother was American. I grew up uh, in much of my childhood in the United States. I went to a US university and as a British diplomat, uh, I served twice in the United States. Uh, so believe me when I say I want to be proud of, of America. Um, so first uh, section, uh, why have transatlantic security relations changed permanently and fundamentally? Uh, from my perspective, the fundamental change is not uh, President Trump, former President Trump himself. In fact, I think uh, Rose may disagree. I don't know that he did some quite salutary things for the NATO alliance. I mean, above all, he gave it a near-death experience, and near-death experiences can be very clarifying for people. Uh, he pressed burden sharing, which is an extremely necessary issue. Uh, and he gave Europe and European allies an acute awareness of how much NATO depends militarily on the United States. Uh, this is uh, a really geostrategic fact that I believe Europeans really do understand. So these things were salutary, but I believe they could, under President Biden, be smoothed and made better. They're not necessarily permanent, although the burden sharing debate will not go away. Rather, I think President Trump revealed to Europeans some fundamental things about America and Europe that they had not fully internally internalized previously. And I'll just very quickly pick out four. Uh, so I think one thing that Europeans discovered first uh, is that the United States is and will remain prepared to be coercive of its allies in pursuit of what it regards as its interests. Uh, the classic case uh, during the Trump presidency was the Iran nuclear deal, uh, where uh, I would date the watershed of European attitudes on America to May 2018 uh, on Iran, when President Trump violated a mandatory UN Security Council resolution and imposed secondary sanctions on America's closest allies to enforce US views on a policy that affects European interests far more intimately than American ones. Uh, and that's not going to change quickly because Congress is okay with secondary sanctions and extraterritoriality. A second uh, wake up for Europeans was uh, the degree to which their European and American foreign policy cultures clash. Uh, Europeans see American approaches to security as much more zero sum, whereas Europeans like to think at any rate that they are more win-win. Europeans are governed by coalition governments. Uh, the EU is run by committees. Compromise is really the name of the game. And again, this is something, this cultural difference uh, in security policy yeah, is something I don't think is gonna change for a long time. Uh, third, there was America first uh, and a superpower acting to some extent regardless of the rules, uh, whereas Europe imagines that it is rules-based. Uh, America first was not about Europe, uh, but it did tell Europeans about an American manner of proceeding. Uh, and crucially, it told them uh, not just about President Trump, but that 40% of the American electorate most of the time had a favorable approval rating for their president. This too, uh, the domestic support for that kind of American approach is only gonna change slowly. And finally, uh, they saw American politics more polarized than ever before. And they still believe that President Trump could come back. So there's a sense in Europe that they can no longer count on 
continuity or predictability in the transatlantic relationship. Uh, they can't count on American commitment to treaties uh, or to uh, enduring American leadership. So trust has been broken and this will take a long time to overcome. What is Europe doing about this? How is it recalibrating? Uh, well, uh, I would suggest that in the core of European public opinion and European elites, there is now a very substantial consensus about the desirability of more European sovereignty. This, this started before President Trump arrived on the scene. Uh, the references to strategic autonomy for Europe really date from the EU's July 2016 global strategy. But Whereas President Bush divided Europe over, for example, Iraq, Trump's America has united it. Uh, President Trump succeeded in pushing even the Germans into the French camp on strategic autonomy. Uh, it was Merkel who said, provoked by US-Iran policy, that, quote, we must take our fate more into our own hands. Europeans may not know what sovereignty, uh, uh, they certainly don't agree on how to go about building it. And, and outliers like the UK and Poland may want a quite different approach towards the United States, although personally I doubt it. Uh, I note that uh, in polling, Brits are no more positive about the United States than the average continental European. But everyone in Europe seems to agree that it, it, it's really got to change. Uh, and I could quote you a lot of polling to show that. I mean, for example, uh, in a, a very recent poll by the ECFR, the European Council on Foreign Relations, polling 15,000 Europeans in 11 countries, uh, no, no surveyed country of those 11, which included Poland and the United Kingdom, would a majority want to take Washington's side in the conflict with Russia. That's a pretty serious conclusion for the NATO alliance. So the European Union at the moment is quite consciously working to equip itself in uh, the EU high representative's words, that's uh, Mr. Borrell's words, to speak the language of power. And it intends to be able to speak it to the United States as much as to Russia or China. This isn't black or white. Uh, it is because everything European is very fitful, uh, but I do think uh, it is fundamental and irreversible. And if you think about it in big picture historical terms, uh, you know, I ask myself, and Americans ask too, why should uh, one of the world's largest economies and some of the richest societies on the planet depend for their defense on an unreliable, overbearing, wrong thinking friend some three and a half thousand miles away. But uh, just to conclude on this fundamental and I think pretty permanent shift, uh, I do need to underline that Europe is absolutely not neutral as between Russia, China and the United States. The United States is really the only other great power open society besides Europe, with the possible exception of India. Uh, and Europe not only needs, but genuinely wants NATO. So second section, um, I want to say a word on current NATO EU dynamics. Uh, this is after all where the US and European tectonic plates kind of meet and grind together. So what's going on? Uh, well, uh, the answer is uh, currently not very much uh, because the pandemic has uh, suppressed activity. Uh, and in fact, COVID has actually meant, uh, uh, actually been quite good for EU NATO relations. NATO's mobilized its militaries, the EU has played coordinator. Uh, there have been largely successful efforts at uh, coordination. Uh, but in fact, both organizations are at the moment uh, more self-absorbed than 
mutually engaged. And the EU has got a, a lot on its plate with Brexit, pandemic, migration, Eurozone problems. NATO has been looking at its plans out to 2030, uh, being pressed by the United States on China and on burden sharing. Uh, however, uh, circumstances are quite propitious for NATO-EU collaboration. Uh, Putin helps ensure that. Uh, in 2016, just before Rose arrived at NATO, uh, at a Warsaw summit, uh, there was an EU-NATO declaration uh, that committed to better collaboration. And there are now 74 areas for possible EU-NATO cooperation, uh, dialogue and communication. Uh, moreover, uh, both institutions uh, in a very real way understand uh, that in the 21st century, uh, to survive, they have to collaborate. Uh, the EU has a lot of the money for infrastructure, but NATO has the hard defense planning, the command and control. Uh, both organizations can do hybrid gray zone uh, competition. Uh, and they share a center of excellence in Helsinki for that. NATO brings the United States to Europe. The EU has important regulatory powers. So there's a tremendous amount to be gained uh, from working together. Uh, and uh, I stress this point because I really want to underline that despite the tendency in the international press to present NATO and EU as an either or proposition, uh, or Europe and the United States uh, as an either or proposition. Uh, these things are not binary. Europeans do really know that they need NATO. Uh, they just want uh, and are accepting the need for more self-reliance. The, the whole NATO EU thing, I can speak to in detail if people are interested because I was quite involved in it in the late 1990s uh, is really uh, a, a product of initial uh, uh, and long-standing, ever since 1066, UK-French mistrust. Uh, but in Washington, as in London and other places, it can be presented as binary, uh, you know, a choice between NATO or strategic autonomy uh, with the United States or not with the United States. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, understand that isn't a reality. However, there are some real tensions at the moment. Uh, the US uh, understandably wants a commanding role on European defense, uh, given all the resources it puts in. Uh, and the EU is moving to position itself as more autonomous uh, in the defense field. It is ramping up its own defense planning. Uh, it's acquired a coordinating capability for security operations that some see as a nascent headquarters. Uh, it's got a new project called PESCO uh, that is uh, creating European defense capabilities by European industry paid for by the European taxpayer. Uh, it, since late October, qualifying third parties like the United States and the UK can play in that program, but they get no say in shaping the agenda. There are European Commission regulations on defense industry, uh, and the EU has very recently adjusted its defense export rules to incentivize a stronger defense industrial base. Uh, President Macron uh, put a French toe in the water on European nuclear deterrence by inviting people to uh, Europeans to collaborate with France on uh, European nuclear exercising. And there's even an internal EU uh, defense burden sharing debate. And then beyond the defense field, we see uh, the EU working on a digital tax uh, and uh, dealing with US big tech, uh, uh, worrying about falling behind on artificial intelligence and tech innovation, uh, trying to build the Euro as an international reserve currency to reduce dollar denominated trade uh, going with the EU-China trade deal is a bit of a power play, despite President B Biden's arrival. Uh, distinctly different uh, European and American approaches to China. Uh, and uh, uh, 
more besides. Uh, so I'm going to turn finally um, to uh, a, a few comments about uh, the way forward and uh, then wrap up. I stressed that uh, the NATO and EU relationship is in no sense binary, and I think uh, that was underlined, if you like, uh, for transatlantic relations uh, when uh, Jens Stoltenberg of NATO and Charles Michel of the European Union met uh, the day before President Biden's inauguration last week and sent an olive branch tweeting how much they were looking forward to working with the president, uh, which has been seen in Europe as a, a deliberate and strong signal of NATO-EU harmony uh, uh, as the new president takes office. The, the NATO-EU thing and transatlantic security relations is really major great power politics. Uh, so. I would say it's worth both sides of the Atlantic Ocean working very hard to try and get it right. Europeans are natural US allies. Uh, the US invests more in the European Union and the EU in the United States than any other two trade blocs. Uh, just as NATO and the EU need each other to handle Russia and China's differing but asymmetric challenges. So I think clearly the United States and Europe need each other on the ge geopolitics, uh, including on security and defense. If nothing else, uh, surely the United States needs Europe to help with the Asia pivot. Uh, uh, the two sides of the Atlantic may not agree on China policy, but Europeans should at least give enough military capability to solve the United States' two theater problem, the, the problem that if, they're, uh, if the US is dealing with a, a China contingency, then Russia could make trouble in Europe. Uh, Europeans perhaps should not be forced to go to the South China Sea, but they should certainly develop enough military capacity for collective self-defense so that the United States does not have to backfill in Europe uh, in a crisis with China. And if nothing else, Europe needs the United States for at least two more decades, I believe, uh, if it is to develop the defense capabilities without the United States to handle the Russia problem. Uh, Europe is massively structurally inefficient on defense, so it will move slowly and pretty prudently uh, on this uh, slogan of strategic autonomy or European sovereignty. I think therefore the United States has very little to fear from uh, strategic autonomy. The biggest mistake would be to uh, make an issue of it. Instead, uh, my proposition is, as I suggested at the beginning, uh, that we should uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, but especially in Washington, embrace the enhancement of European and even specifically EU military capabilities so that Europeans can be better allies to Americans. Uh, in fact, it would be terrific if the United States can operate autonomously, uh, if, uh, excuse me, Europe can operate autonomously. Uh, and as a matter of uh, political principle, uh, a degree of European autonomy was negotiated between NATO and the EU uh, as long ago as 1992 in something called the Petersburg Tasks. What specifically should be done? Well, I'm sorry to say that I'm um, quite pessimistic about the uh, prognosis for uh, what I am advocating and, and for therefore the long-term future of transatlantic security relations because of cultural differences, because of commercial pressures and, and nationalist politics. But uh, I would advocate four or five things. I'm, one is that both sides need to work the politics. I think President Biden should, and you can already see how unrealistic uh, this is politically, but should announce that the United States is committed to building European strategic autonomy. France, other Europeans and the EU should announce, as they have before, uh, that they want to work with and through NATO. Uh, 
Uh, ideally, they would go as far as saying that it will always be their preference to act under NATO, NATO Article 5 uh, uh, for collective defense rather than the corresponding article in the EU Lisbon Treaty. Uh, politically, you could put it this way, that the Americans need to be more humble, as I have heard President Biden and Tony Blinken say they intend to be. The Brits need to be more European, the Germans need to be more bold, and the French need to be a little bit less French. Uh, that's a way of suggesting that uh, Washington should make an effort to resuscitate the uh, confidential talks uh, between Washington, Berlin, Paris, and London. It was a huge mistake to have let that mechanism go. Uh, there also needs to be an effort, so this is my second uh, policy suggestion, to fix the uh, NATO-EU relationship institutionally. The default setting really for the two organizations, even though they're in the same city, is inertia. Uh, and the process of deepening collaboration needs to be given in some kind of impulse uh, and uh, institutionalization. Uh, this, I regret to say, may not be possible uh, unless the United States really uh, exerts itself uh, with Europe on fixing the uh, Turkey problem that has for many, many years uh, prevented uh, real uh, NATO-EU uh, practical collaboration. Um, at the moment, the uh, dialogue is just one between international staffs. You could do some other things too. You could consider a European defence planning pillar inside NATO to work with the EU defence planning mechanism. You could open all NATO centres of excellence to the European Union and where relevant vice versa. A third area, no less difficult uh, than the others, I regret to say, uh, is uh, trying to fix European capability shortfalls more imaginatively, transatlantically. Uh, you could uh, uh, broaden the NATO spending definitions to give Europeans more credit for what they do on security. You could measure uh, their output and their outcomes on security rather than just 2% of GDP. Uh, you could resuscitate the joint EU-NATO Capabilities Committee to provide some governance for European defense programming priorities. Uh, uh, and here, but uh, again, I realize this is unrealistic, you could incentivize US purchase of European defense products and incentivize transatlantic collaborations that drive European defense industrial collaboration. Uh, the defense industry competition is one of the, the deep problems uh, that uh, drives a wedge down the middle of the Atlantic uh, and that is very difficult to fix. And last, uh, because I'm really now done, um, we need to try across the Atlantic to address uh, the what I call the ideology deficit. Uh, we're not uh, competing with the autocrats at the moment. We do need to rededicate to open society resilience. Uh, Europeans need the United States to succeed and vice versa. Biden's summit of democracies needs to be not just a love-in, uh, but agreement on large collaborative programs for mutual support. European leaders need to say clearly that Europe needs a healthy, happy, united USA and dedicate themselves to the hard grind of getting that accepted by their own populations. Uh, and above all, uh, we all need to fix ourselves at home uh, because I think, and this is my last point, of all the essential NATO, EU and transatlantic security and defense dynamics, the most important thing to concentrate on right now is not, in fact, security or defense policy, but our respective domestic politics. Uh, that is the defense center of gravity right now. Thank you for listening, uh, and I uh, would love a discussion. Excellent. Well, we've already got a few questions, um, but I am going to take the prerogative of the chair to ask a brief one. I'm 
amused, Adam, maybe it's because you're sitting up there in Scotland, but you haven't mentioned Brexit once. But one of the abiding questions as I was departing NATO was, what would be uh, the UK's role in continuing to nurture and develop a cooperation between Europe and the United States post-Brexit when it no longer has a seat at the EU table? Uh, I've understood UK uh, commitment to redoubling its efforts with regard to NATO cooperation and NATO investments, but uh, could you say a word about uh, how you see the situation evolving now that the UK uh, has departed the EU? Yeah, happy to. Um, I should stress that uh, what I'm running is a European NGO, not a British one, and I try and be relatively dispassionate about uh, British uh, policies and, and not too engaged in them. But um, I, 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 I can't help but join a consensus, which is that outside the EU, the uh, UK's security and defense leverage is somewhat diminished. Uh, it just leaves the UK with uh, fewer tools, uh, including in Washington. Uh, and uh, if I was the new US administration, I would indeed, as everybody says they will, uh, be going to Paris and Berlin. Um, uh, so the counsel I give uh, to those in London who ask is basically what I've said just now, uh, and uh, it's no less provocative to the present British government, but uh, the UK uh, should put its uh, defense capability where its mouth is. It has said that although it is leaving the EU, it is not leaving Europe. Well, I think it should embrace the idea of greater European defense capabilities uh, and work with the EU, albeit from outside, to boost uh, Euro a European capacity to act uh, independently of the United States, if necessary, uh, not because of uh, hostility or opposition to the US, but to be a better European uh, uh, set of allies uh, for the United States militarily. And if the UK were to do that, uh, forgive me for laboring a, ho a hobby horse, it would position itself and Europe so much better. I mean, the UK does carry transatlantic water. It could help ensure that the European strategic autonomy drive remained US friendly. Uh, uh, and it would massively boost uh, UK standing uh, in Europe at a time when it sorely needs it. Very interesting watching these developments uh, from, from this distance out in California, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, Michael McFall asks for your comments about the divisions within Europe about these issues, and he particularly drills down on the question of Russia. If Biden seeks to take a more confrontational approach toward Russia, will such a policy have European support or will it cause tensions? Uh, well, it, it's a great question, and, and Michael McFall, McFall knows a great deal more about this than I do, uh, really, uh, so I, I hesitate, but um, he's perfectly right. I, know I quoted uh, uh, a poll uh, recently by ECFR uh, that shows that maybe Europeans wouldn't take the US side uh, in a conflict with Russia, and uh, as I'm sure Michael knows, there's also polling to suggest that in Germany specifically, uh, Germans are... are pretty much evenly balanced between whether they uh, worry more about Russia or worry more about the United States. So a, a US drive on Russia uh, isn't going to be completely straightforward, but I think it's also not a big worry as far as I am uh, concerned. Uh, President Putin is uh, doing brilliantly at uh, bringing uh, the United States and Europe together <laughs> on Russia policy. Um, uh, you know, it, it's in Salisbury uh, uh, that uh, uh, banned substances, uh, chemical, you know, chemicals are used. It's it's it, it's it's a German hospital that looks after Navalny uh, 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 it, uh, and is upset uh, when he's arrested uh, on return. Um, I, I think that um, 
Europeans are uh, very ready for a tougher approach on Russia, pr provided uh, a couple other things happen. Uh, one is, and this goes very much in what I understand to be the new administration's direction, one is that uh, it must be kept secure. So uh, I think uh, Steve Pfeiffer and others talk about putting guardrails around it. Um, it, it. It is important to do the arms control. Uh, and in a significant reversal from the US position in NATO under the last administration, I think the United States really needs to push the case for deterrence reasons, for guardrail reasons, really needs to push uh, for uh, NATO-Russia dialogue. This was blocked under the last administration, unforgivably, in my view, uh, very alienating for particularly the French and Germans, uh, and, and just not in NATO's interests. So if the administration said, uh, we're going to do arms control uh, and risk reduction, and part of that is military to military and poll mill dialogue, purposeful for risk reduction, not business as usual, then a much tougher uh, approach, I think, could be adopted quite easily by NATO as a whole. I, forgive me, uh, Rose, one more thing for Michael, but um, Russia is divisive in the alliance. Uh, it has been. There is no uh, NATO strategy towards Russia uh, at the moment. Uh, and I really would like to see the Biden administration lead uh, a, a drive, a difficult but necessary and possible, to agree a Russia strategy under the new NATO strategic concept. I agree with you, Adam. I do hope that in the course of putting together the new strategic concept, there will be uh, a wide ranging and serious discussion of this matter, because I agree with you. Uh, we're at a point where the exchanges were rather sterile uh, in any event. But I do agree with you also that there are areas such as uh, crisis avoidance, incident response, where some, uh, some urgent work could be done. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, a number of questions. I just want to remind uh, participants that you can post your questions in the chat. The next question is from David Elliott, who asks, do you see a difficult pathway for US reentry into the Iran nuclear agreement? Um, is there a pathway for US reentry? Uh, yes, um, but it won't be easy. Um, uh, you know, I, I regret, but uh, Iran has pretty consistently over what is it now, 40 years or so, uh, ensured that it is a bugbear in the United States uh, that uh, means the US can't even be helpful to Iran when it wants to. Um, uh, and uh, Iranian uh, bazaar style negotiating is, in, is on full display right now in saying the US must uh, drop sanctions and you know maybe then they'll return to compliance. Um, uh, the European Leadership Network does a lot of work on Iran uh, and specifically uh, the JCPOA, Iran nuclear deal. Um, I mean, one thing uh, I would very strongly counsel if it is if, if you know, US congressmen can bring themselves to it is to just concentrate on getting back into the JCPOA and not uh, uh, load the Christmas tree with trying to sort missiles or Iranian regional behavior at the same time. Um, these things are whole separate negotiations in their own right, really complex. Uh, so just concentrate uh, on doing the JCPOA. Uh, and I don't think uh, it, it, I, I I, I think we all need it badly enough, uh, Europe above all, Iran and the US, uh, to uh, not make this too complicated. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, warm greetings to you from Stephen Stedman. And uh, a good hey. question, continuing the, the line you were already pursuing with, uh, with Michael. 
falls, but this time more focused on domestic politics, uh, even because uh, for the longest time, we could pretend that domestic politics mattered at the margins of foreign and security policy, that whatever differences there were between uh, Bush and Obama, for example, were still bounded by continuity and predictability. You said that uh, Trump and his uh, kind of his brand of domestic politics have thrown a curveball into our assumptions about the shared transatlantic security future. What do you think now? Could you say something about how you see domestic politics in, in Europe and the UK and how they affect future relations? Will it be bounded by continuity or are there more curveballs coming at us? Uh, great question. Hi, Steve. Um, lovely to hear from you. Uh, and one day I really will visit Stanford uh, in person. Um, uh, it, it's extremely difficult to say. I mean, th th there have already been uh, European uh, domestic political curveballs. Brexit was one of those. Uh, it was a, uh, it was an expression, n not so much about Europe, but about domestic political frustrations. Uh, very deep, very difficult to overcome, um, and. Uh, there are similar dynamics in, in, in most European countries. Uh, so I think uh, it, it would be prudent analysis to expect upheavals in at least some countries. Um, God willing, we will be spared uh, the worst. I mean, uh, a, a Marine Le Pen uh, victory in the next French presidential elections? Uh, I don't know. But uh, just as uh, the United States now has a uh, an alt right, if you like, uh, that is addicted to conspiracy theory, uh, Europe's got its fair share of that too, uh, and in massive generalization, I would say that was still gaining ground rather than receding. Um, so I repeat my, my closing point, I guess, uh, which is that if, if we want uh, good transatlantic relations and, and, and good security for all our open societies, the thing we really need to attend to is not so much defense policy as domestic. Thank you very much for that. Uh, moving to Germany, Steve Pfeiffer, who is uh, with us from Berlin asks, you mentioned the need for Germany to be more bold. Can you drill down on that? What are some specifics you would like to see Germany do? What are the chances, do you think, that Berlin will actually do them? Uh, yeah, um, no, uh, nice question, Steve. Um, you're, you're the one in Berlin now, so uh, you, know, you should tell me. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I don't pretend these are easy. I mean, given given the uh, the Bundestag oversight on uh, German military deployment, for example, uh, I think that uh, the politics are not straightforward. But um, Germany, I, I think, uh, it, it it kind of uh, understands this, and it is kind of doing it, uh, but. Uh, it, it could do two things a lot better uh, or try to. Uh, one is to um, build its uh, defense capabilities so that they are um, more formidable. Uh, there's permission in Europe for that. It's, this is not just a question about uh, how much is spent. Uh, but on, uh, on what it is spent uh, and how it is intended to be employed. Uh, it, it, good things have been done. You know, the Germans are deployed in the Baltic Republics, for example. Um, but uh, I, I, I think evidence of a more determined German effort would be uh, very helpful uh, in Europe and in the transatlantic relationship. Uh, and there's a political side to that. The Germans are, frankly, now uh, the center of gravity for European security. Uh, and it would be great to see them willing to take on more 
policy and political leadership uh, for that fact. Um, uh, they are, for all the historical reasons, still nervous about being seen as leaders. Uh, and uh, so they do pull their punches a bit, I think, uh, more in NATO than in the European Union. Uh, Rose, you could comment on this too. Yes, indeed, but we have a number of good questions, so I, I won't on this occasion. We have uh, a related question actually from and that is, how do you see the EU potentially upping its military capabilities? Will it be done on a country by country basis or somehow will there be a broader EU basis? I suppose that speaks to uh, an agreed capabilities process. You mentioned the notion of revivifying NATO EU uh, capabilities uh, consultations and setting those requirements somehow together. But what do you think about this question? Is it everybody, everyone for himself or uh, they'll try to do it in a more organized manner under the EU aegis? It's definitely not every man for himself um, uh, because there is a, I mean, the, the, the EU card process uh, for defense planning is, is, uh, is in, in its infancy, it's uh, just taking uh, baby steps, and it uh, doesn't have uh, the uh, either the political or the institutional uh, mechanisms that NATO has for driving, a compl you know, getting with the defence program, if you like. Um, but I don't think there is real pushback in the EU on that uh, defence planning process, uh, and uh, although I, I'm not predicting this, uh, I think that. Uh, if the EU does sustain, as I believe it will, this ambition for greater uh, European sovereignty and, and ability to look after its own interests rather better than it can at the moment, uh, it is in the end going to have to uh, set out a, ro a, a European defence capability roadmap uh, that is uh, going to have and it'll have to stretch beyond 2030 i mean it it really needs to go to 2040. Um, it, it it involves a, a defense industrial component it involves uh, some quite serious prioritization uh, as between nato tasks and more uh, eu civ mil tasks and that's why i think there is room for actually a really productive not a confrontational conversation between NATO and the EU uh, about how to get the, e the, the European Union moving along uh, this capabilities uh, roadmap. Yes, I would really welcome that. That was always, as you know, one of the conditions we wanted uh, to see fulfilled from the NATO side in terms of NATO-EU cooperation and uh, autonomy on the EU side, that is, that we needed to bring our requirements processes together. And so I think that, that to me is a, a nice proposal. Now, Yen Ling Fu is taking us to China, asking, how does China's global sharp power affect NATO EU cooperation? Global which power? Global sharp power affect NATO EU cooperation. Global shock power. Sharp, as in sharp. Sharp, sharp uh -huh. pins, yes. Right. Um, I, I'm not much of an expert on this, frankly, um, but uh, sitting uh, in my European Leadership Network NGO, one thing has been really striking in the last 18 months, uh, which is the degree to which uh, European attitudes towards China have, uh, have reversed. Uh, it, uh, China is now seen as a, a significant um, strategic competitor, not just a, a commercial proposition. Um, Europeans are waking up to uh, Chinese uh, acquisition of critical national infrastructure in Europe, for example, uh, and drawing rather sobering conclusions. Um, and I expect this will continue. I mean, the Borel phrase of 
learning to speak the language of power is about China uh, uh, in part. Um, but my sense is that although attitudes in Europe are by no means Euro uh, uniform and, and you know, the, 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 uh, China has already developed a, a special relationship in the, what is it, 17 plus one mechanism, for example, in the uh, uh, eastern half of the continent uh, that uh, creates a dynamic that's a bit different from its relationship with some of the uh, larger uh, Western European countries. Uh, I do think that as a generalization, uh, European approaches to China are and will remain appreciably different from the United States. I do not think Europe is, has been comfortable in being pressured by the Trump administration uh, uh, on a more adversarial relationship. Uh, the, the whole Huawei debate has been very uncomfortable. And to the extent that Europeans have gone along with US positions on excluding Huawei from uh, 5G, uh, it, it has been as much because they worry that they will not, because of US sanctions, be able to make uh, a relationship work as a reluctance to uh, employ Chinese technology. Many Europeans, including the UK, believe they can manage the uh, technology security problem. This goes back to the, the foreign policy cultural difference. Um, the US tends to be, if I may generalize, a little bit more black and white uh, about its great power competition. Uh, Europe tends to see if it can find more win-win approaches. We could talk about China a great deal more, but uh, let um, me take us. And, and should I, because you know, I'm to, I'm talking to a a West Coast uh, uh, meeting, and uh, I need educating. So, <laughs> well, only to say that uh, we'll have to think about a future lecture in this uh, in this vein, and uh, invite you, uh, Adam, to participate. Uh, I have a question from Emily Tro, taking us back to the United States and its uh, its recent policies. Uh, she talks about the way the U.S. has been so on again, off again uh, with regard to sanctions in the preceding period, talking about U.S. tariffs on EU steel on again, off again, et cetera, uh, as an example. And so asks a very directed uh, and pragmatic question, how can the U.S. repair its legitimacy in this regard? In, in terms of its continuity uh, of policies? I, mean, I think the European answer is, is, is pretty straightforward. It's not completely realistic, uh, but um, the, uh, the US should allow the World Trade Organization to function and stop neutering it uh, and uh, should play by WTO rules um, and not just when it suits it. Uh, it should stop applying secondary sanctions to its nearest <laughs> allies uh, and instead try to solve uh, differences about strategy on things like Iran uh, through diplomacy rather than coercion. Uh, that would take us a very long way. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not as hopeful uh, uh, as my prescription, I'm afraid, that that will actually uh, will actually happen. Um, there are strong protectionist streaks in the uh, uh, Democratic Party. Uh, Congress is perfectly comfortable with uh, US extraterritoriality or, or secondary sanctions. So this is going to be uh, an area of friction and it feeds my uh, further pessimism about uh, transatlantic uh, defense industrial collaboration uh, and whether uh, uh, that's going to be managed in a way that is mutually beneficial or uh, actually rather full of friction. We have a number of uh, questions that we're going to have to wrap up. So if I may, Adam, these questions relate to uh, industrial and economic policy. So I will group them together. I think they, they work as a, as a single kind of theme for you to, to wrap up and it will be our last. To those of you who uh, did not have their questions answered, I apologize. We had a really good response to uh, the discussion today. So uh, first of all, um, 
Perry Bloom asked, to what extent are European domestic political divisions driven by disagreements on migration and refugee, uh, the refugee crisis, where Dan Zhukov asks, and uh, what about uh, economic and industrial policy? How about differences over Nord Stream 2, for example? Is that what is uh, driving differences in, inside Europe? And finally, um, uh, Arthur Honig asks the impact, the economic impact of COVID-19 and whether that will drive European countries to prioritize their own domestic manufacturers or will it be possible to develop greater inter integration and consolidation of the European arms industry uh, during this uh, post-pandemic, we hope soon to be post-pandemic period. So I know that's a lot on your plate, Adam, to wrap up with, but you can hear that there's interest in our listeners uh, as to what's happening with, uh, with economics and industrial policy and how that feeds into the other issues we've been discussing today. So please, over to you. Uh, thanks, and, and those are all uh, very good uh, questions. I, I guess, uh, and the first thing to say is that uh, Europe is riven with dissension all the time. Uh, and <laughs> um, it, uh, you know, refugees migration has been uh, massively divisive. Um, uh, defense industrial policy is horrendous. I mean, there's not very much, although the European Commission in the last two years has started to uh, try and get a grip on this. Uh, so everyone's got different export controls. That's the significance of a small step uh, towards uh, aligning them. Um, uh, the, the the economic impacts of COVID will be uh, will be various. Um, uh, one early reaction to uh, COVID uh, was uh, the EU refusing to export any of its um, health equipment to countries uh, that might be badly hit. Perfectly understandable, but uh, uh, very uh, disruptive for global supply chains. Uh, and the, uh, you know, if the EU has learned that it depends on the United States for its defense, it's uh, learned also that it depends on global supply chains uh, for its health. Uh, how does that uh, how does that cookie crumble? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think um, uh, if I can generalize massively, first of all, the EU is not going to collapse. Uh, I, I remember my American friends when I was at Harvard over 40 years ago, uh, uh, predicting the European Union's demise and it hasn't happened. Uh, Brexit has, if anything, uh, reinforced uh, EU cohesion among the uh, remaining members. Uh, uh, the EU will work through its problems, uh, uh, producing a, a migration uh, policy, for example, it's already doing um, some nasty and some moderately imaginative things in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, it, 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 it will gradually, uh, I believe, uh, uh, move towards defense industrial uh, uh, consolidation. Um, th th there will be countercurrents, so there will be pressures for uh, you know, protecting uh, national assets in some areas, and that could it could include defense. But my proposition uh, this morning for you, evening for me, has been that um, the 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 move, the ambition for greater European uh, uh, resilience and ability to look after itself uh, is is real. It's not going to go away, and over time, I think that will drive more cooperation rather than division. The one thing that um, bothers me analytically about that rather glib uh, proposition is, is indeed the uh, COVID's economic impact. I mean, what 2008 did to the Euro-Atlantic community's domestic politics was horrendous. Uh, and we're now being told that uh, COVID is going to give us uh, an economic crisis uh, greater than anything we've seen in 300 years. What is that going to do uh, for domestic politics? Uh, it's not going to make anything easier in the EU, but at the same time, uh, if we 
if we can hold our domestic politics together, I believe that the EU uh, will be seen by its remaining members as um, at least a necessary evil. I mean, it's just agreed very, it, it's taken a step to raise money uh, on the strength of being the EU for the first time in its history. Uh, that has created, uh, what is it, roughly 750 billion uh, euros to spread around uh, on the European project. Now, there will be more of that. Uh, uh, shall I? <laughs> I'll stop there. We're over time. <laughs> We are a bit, but uh, it's really been fascinating uh, listening to you today, Adam, and you've raised, I think, so many themes and issues that it's uh, making me think about what some of our next lectures should be. So I'm also very grateful to you for that. Uh, Sir Adam Thompson, I wish you could uh, see all the faces of all participating. We've had an excellent uh, group today with uh, very, very good questions, and uh, I am raising my hand to give you applause. I hope everyone else is as well. But uh, thank you so very, very much. And uh, we look forward to uh, engaging you and the European Leadership Network on uh, future events at, at Stanford. And as, uh, as uh, uh, Stephen Stedman said, it'll be great to have you out at Stanford before too long. We hope we don't have to wait a whole nother year. That would be wonderful. Well, thank you for the privilege. It's been a real pleasure, Rose. Thank you. And thanks to all everyone. Right. Who's listened. All, all right. All the best. Thank you all for participating today and uh, we'll be in touch soon with uh, our next scheduled lecture. All the best to all.